Well, good morning and welcome to the Willow Park Baptist Church online live service. Be sure to click like, hit share, let your friends know we're live right now, and then sing out. Let your neighbors hear you praising this morning. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break. His broken hearts declare His praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is For the sins of the world, His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before Him. I sing it out this morning, so open up the gates. Open up the gates. Make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fire. Battles, and every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before Him. Stop the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? So who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Sins of the world, his blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before him.
I want to welcome you this morning. Uh, I know it's a little different day for us, but here we sit with a freezing cold weather in Texas, and we never have this kind of weather. But I just thought as your pastor that I want to make sure that we were safe, uh, make sure that everybody stays in a place where you're not going to be injured. And, uh, you know, it's, it's dangerous. I mean, the wind chill out there is a minus 13, 14, or 15, something like that. The actual temperature is around zero this morning. And then you start thinking, hey, we don't live in Michigan or Wisconsin somewhere where we do this all the time. Uh, we're here in Texas, and we don't have the snow plows and all the stuff that's going on. And then when you add ice into that, uh, it becomes a very, very, very dangerous thing. And then you add the temperatures and all that's going on, and especially this week uh, with what we've seen out on I-35. I know many of you have been praying for the 133 cars that piled up out there and the many people that were injured and some that died and praying for their families. And just, it's a tragic thing. And so I, I just want us to be safe. Uh, we live right here by I-20, and I didn't want anything to happen to us. So I just said, hey, man, let's just make sure that this morning our people are home, our people are warm, our people are staying safe. And I'll just tell you this, we're not going to have a service tonight, so you don't have to worry about that. And then we're going to watch the weather this week because we know we've got some more weather coming in. And we'll send out some alerts to you about what we're going to do on Wednesday night. Uh, We're just going to wait and see. But we know that this is supposed to be one of the coldest weeks that we've ever had in Texas. So uh, just be watching. Make sure you stay safe. And if you have any questions... Uh, you can go to the church website, yeah, you can go to uh, a church text, church app, uh, you can go to Facebook or anything on social media, and you can see exactly what's going on for us all this week. So hey, I love you, and I appreciate you being here with us this morning. Get your Bibles and go with me to Habakkuk uh, chapter 3. Habakkuk chapter 3, and we've made our way all the way through the first two chapters, and now today we're going to cover all 19 verses in the third chapter, as today we look at the prophet. But it's not just a prophet, but it's a prophet who is worshiping. And I want us just to read the first two verses, and we're going to make our way down through the passage. And uh, you stay with me. Get your family gathered up. Uh, send this out. Uh, make sure that your friends and family are watching us now. And uh, let's get into the Word of God. So Habakkuk chapter 3, where it says, uh, a prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, uh, and the Bible says something about a prophet here. It says that this prophet uh, is a man that has gone to God for the nation of Judah. 
You remember that there's a difference between a priest and a prophet. A priest goes to God for the people, but the prophet goes to the people for God. In other words, he gets a word from God. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. Look at verse 2 where it says, Oh, Lord. It says, I have heard thy speech, and I was afraid, and was afraid. Oh, Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known in wrath, remember mercy. So, so we look at the prophet Habakkuk, who in the first two chapters finds himself in a valley, which is easy to do. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter what your economics are. The fact is, is that everybody has good days and everybody has bad days. The Bible said, all you who live godly in Christ Jesus, it said you're going to suffer persecution. It said to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. The greatest psalm of all, the one that we read the most, Psalm 23 says, yea, though I walk through the valley, everybody has valleys. I, I wish I could just say, man, like they say on television, man, you, you'll never have any more problems. You'll be healthy, wealthy, happy, and wise. But that's not what the prophet is giving to us here. He was in a valley in the first two chapters. And in that valley, he's doing something. He, he is wrestling. He's wrestling with what he sees. Uh, he's wrestling with what is happening. He, he's wrestling with Judah, which is Israel. He, he's wrestling with the Chaldeans, which is the pa Babylonians. And, and he doesn't understand why this is happening. He, he looks up and says, why, why is this going on? And, and why is Judah not turning towards God? And, and why is it that they've wandered away? And then he sees that judgment is coming. And, and he doesn't understand that judgment. And he doesn't like that judgment. Neither do we. Uh, the Bible said that if you be without chastisement, it says then are you illegitimate. We know that, that, that because God loves us, there's times when God corrects us. And, and if we know that, surely Habakkuk knew that. And so we see where he, he, he knows that they're wrong. He knows that judgment's coming. But he doesn't understand why it's coming through the Babylonians. They, they're a wicked people. They don't know God. They don't care about the things of God. Why are we going to be judged by these people? And so the Bible says when you go to chapter 2 and then go to verse 1, it says, I will stand upon my watch. I will set upon my tower, set me upon my tower, and will watch to see what he will say unto me. And I will answer. And then it says, when I am reproved. You see, Habakkuk said, wait a minute, I, I'm going to get up. I'm going to stand on that watchtower. I'm going to wait on God. I'm going to look at the circumstances. But then he makes that statement, when I am reproved. I don't know that Habakkuk had been in sin, but, but the people had. And Habakkuk represented those people. And Habakkuk knew that, hey, there was a chastisement coming. He said, man, I, I want to be reproved. I, I, I want to be corrected. And so we come through those first two chapters with, uh, in many ways, uh, the prophet bewildered. But now we come where he does something. He starts to pray. He starts to seek God. He doesn't understand the circumstances, but he knows something about God. He knows that God is faithful. He knows that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He knows if there's one thing he can count on, he can count on God, and we can count on God. And the Bible said this in Proverbs 14, verse 26. It says, in the fear of the Lord is strong confidence. That word fear there means a reverence. We have a reverential awe for who God is. I mean, there's just something about when you read the Bible, there, there's just something about when you come into God's presence that there ought to be a reverence and there ought to be an awe. There ought to be something that, that just moves us to the fact this is not just anybody. No, we are in the presence of God. Oh, oh, it, ought, it, ought, it ought to stir us to seek his face. And it says, in the fear of God, a strong confidence. That word confidence means that there's a place of refuge. When everybody else is running from God, as believers, we get to run to God. We have strong confidence knowing that he is our refuge. And you see, Habakkuk didn't look up and immediately see the circumstances changed. But the deal is, is that Habakkuk changed. Not the circumstances, but the man. Oh, friend, I, 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 I'm in the turnaround business. As believers in Jesus Christ, we, we are in the turnaround business. We're, we're in the start over business. Praise God. I mean, praise God that God lets us start over today. That we are not what we used to be. That, that we're not living like we used to live. That we, that we get to start again. The Bible said, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Man, praise God. You don't have to live like you used to live. And you don't have to think like you used to think. And you don't have to act like you used to act. Hey, this is the turnaround business. 
We get to start again because the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, it cleanses us from all sin, all friend. There's a good news. And the good news is that God loves you. And the good news is, is that Jesus died for you. And the good news is that when you come to faith, you get to start over. Then after you come to faith and, and things don't go right and you find yourself in horrible circumstances, man, God lets you stop, turn around and start over. Start again. Every day is a new day. Every day we count his mercies new. You see, Habakkuk knew that God works for his own. In other words, God looks around. He says, man, that's my child. That's not just any child, it's my child. And you see, there's a difference between a child of God and a creation of God. Everybody's a creation of God, but oh, if you're saved today, you're a child of God. And, and God works on his own. What does he say? What should we then say to these things? If God be for us, and he is, if God be for us, who can be against us? You see, God works for his own. Uh, God can do in our lives what well, we can never do for ourselves. God can do for our children and God can do for our family and God can do for our friends what we could never do. And Habakkuk knew that. God can move and, and God can change. You see, he knew that if they would just seek God, if, if they would just stay with the, the vision of who God is and what he could do, he knew that a new day was coming. Psalm 30 and verse five says, for his anger, endureth for a moment. In his favor is life. Did you get that? In God's favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Have you ever thought about that joy? It's a gift from God. You see, we have the, the right to pursue happiness in, in the United States of America, but no one but God can give you joy. And the psalmist said, oh man, but joy cometh in the morning. Joy comes on a new day. You see, there's a new day coming. Habakkuk knows that God hears his prayers and he knows that God honors his own word. And he knew, he knew this. He knew that walking with God was right and he knew that walking with God was worth it. Oh, it might take some effort to read your Bible. It might take some effort to be in church. It, it might take some effort to pray. But I tell you, walking with God works. So I want to give you quick, three quick thoughts this morning. Number one, when Habakkuk prayed, he was praying for the work of God. And go back to verse one again. Where in Habakkuk chapter three and verse one, he says this. It says a prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet. And then he says in verse two, O Lord, I have heard thy speech. You see, Habakkuk knew who he was. Habakkuk knew his rights. Habakkuk knew his responsibilities. Habakkuk knew what God wanted to do in his life. And Habakkuk knew who he was. And hey, you gotta know who you are. You, you gotta know that, man, if you're saved, you are saved for time and eternity. You've gotta know that if you're saved, that in the word of God, there are 30,000 plus promises and all of them are meant to be, or at least most of them are meant to be appropriated to your life. You see, he knew who he was. He was a prophet. That word prophet there means he was under the influence of the divine spirit. He was an inspired man. You talk about living. Life really takes shape and form, and life really gets good when you know you're God's man, when you know you're God's woman, when you live your life inspired by the divine spirit, and we would know that to be the Holy Spirit of God. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21 says... For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. I'm just persuaded that if God could move men then, that God can move us now. You see, he stood up and Habakkuk was, a, was what we call a declaration prophet. He told the people the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. He, he was not ashamed of preaching. Oh, listen, preaching never goes out of style. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. Do it with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but they will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Oh, that's the generation that we're living in. That's the generation Habakkuk was in. But Habakkuk stood up and he had a declaration ministry. He was speaking for God. He was speaking knowing that the divine spirit, the Holy Ghost of God was moving in his life. 
See, sometimes Habakkuk and prophets are blamed for, for what comes out as negative. Oh, hey, he's negative. Oh, oh, he's got a negative message. Oh, listen, he had a message from God, and that message was a right message. That message was a responsible message. And, and when you look at Habakkuk, Habakkuk gave the truth. Did it come off at times negative? Yes. But I'll tell you this, we want the truth. You go to a doctor, and there's something wrong inside of you. You want that doctor to tell you the truth. Uh, you look up and see what's going on in society and you want somebody to stand up and to declare the truth. And I believe the man of God is responsible for that. You see, the truth is, is that Habakkuk and anybody that has the truth cannot please everybody. One of the greatest quotes I've ever heard is I don't know the quickest way to success, but I know the quickest way to failure and that's to try and please everybody. You see, Habakkuk and every man of God, every, every person that stands up with a declaration ministry, there's only one that has to get, to get their, we have to get their approval from, and that is from God. Our approval comes from God. You see, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2, it says, moreover, it's required of a steward that a man be found faithful. Habakkuk was faithful. Habakkuk preached the truth. Acts chapter 5 and verse 29 says, it's better to obey God rather than men. You see, this is a prayer song. This is him praying God's word. And, and there's something about knowing that, God, we don't know what's going on. God, we don't know how to change the circumstances. God, we can't change anybody. It'd be a really good day if we just realized we can't change another person, but that God can. Jim Cimbala, in his book, Fresh Wind and Fresh Fire, gave a great quote. He said, I have discovered an astonishing truth that God is attracted to weakness. Did you hear that? God is attracted to weakness. He said, there are times when we come humbly and honestly and we bow before God in desperation that somehow that's attractive to God, that we're not in charge and we don't know the answers and God, I don't know what to do, but God, you do. See, all through the Bible, the Bible talks about humbling yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that in due season he might exalt you. You see, Habakkuk knew that as he prayed the word of God, that the word of God was dwelling in him richly, and that the word of God was going to be fulfilled, and, and he knew that if God gave him a word, that God was obligated to keep that word, and, and there was something happening as he prayed for the work of God. We studied here recently uh, the book of Ephesians on Sunday night. And I, I was just, I, I've looked at it many times, but when we came to Ephesians chapter 6, and we came to verse 12, it says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And then it says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. You see, the, 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 the Apostle Paul said that we, we don't walk and we don't, we're not battling flesh and blood battles. But he used that word principalities. That word principalities there can many times be translated demons. You see, the, the, the devil has his emissary. And just like there's a real God, there's a real devil. And he has emissaries and, and, and they're demons. And, and they come after you and they, and they attack you. He said, well, listen, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities. That's demons but against powers. That's those who are in rulership. That's those in government, and they don't have a godly life. They don't have a, a godly worldview. Then he talked about against the rulers of darkness. That is those who are ignorant of the divine, but it also means that darkness holds them, that darkness sways them. Then he goes on to talk about against spiritual wickedness in high places. That means there's malice. That means there are those in this world and, and they have evil purposes. All you have to do is turn on your television every night and you realize that what Paul was saying was right. But then he says something in that verse 13. He says, wherefore, he said, I don't care about the demons. I don't care about the powers. I don't care about the darkness. I don't care about their ignorance of the divine. He said, we have a weapon. And by the way, next Sunday morning, uh, we're going to talk about the weapons of our warfare. I've got a message that I can't wait to preach it. And it's talking just about this. But here's what it says. It says, wherefore, take unto you 
The whole armor of God. In other words, you have a responsibility. We have the word of God. We have the name of Jesus. We have the blood of Jesus. And we are to use those in our life. And we're going to talk about that next week. And then he talks about the whole armor of God. There's something about the name of God. There, there's something about the name of Jesus. When, when Philippians 2 says that one day every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess. Listen, you, you're not a victim. You're the victor because of Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to talk about that you may be able, to, be able to stand. You know what that means? That means to resist. You say, I'm getting beat down. Man, I'm under attack. Well, well that's life. But oh, you have a resistance. You have an opposition. And notice this, in the evil day, he's talking there about hurtful harassment that comes against your life. And everybody who's listening to my voice knows about hurtful harassment that's come to your life. But here's what he says. And he says, and having done all to stand. In other words, I've done the work fully. I'm going to stand upright. I'm going to stand in the presence of an evil world. And I'm going to say that God is God. Let God be true and every man a liar. You say, oh, it could never happen to me. That's what Samson said. He said, oh, it could never happen to me. That's exactly what David said. Amazing. You go to the Old Testament. And there's uh, two verses, three verses about the, a man by the name of Jabez. And it says, and Jabez called on the name of the Lord. It said, oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed. Oh, that thou wouldest enlarge my coast. Oh, that thou wouldest put thine hand upon me. Here's what he said. That thou wouldest keep me from evil, that it may not grieve me. You see, here was Habakkuk. And Habakkuk knew, the blessed God, I'm coming under attack. And Jabez knew, I'm coming under attack. But I want you to know, I'm going to stay away from the evil. I'm not going to let this grieve me. You go to verse 2, and again, Habakkuk says this. He said, oh, Lord, he's talking here about the self-existent eternal one. He's talking about Jehovah God. He's self-existent. He's eternal. He's in charge. He said, I have heard thy speech. And he said, I was afraid. What does that mean? You go to James chapter 1, verse 22. And there's an admonition from James, a half-brother Jesus. He said not to just be a hearer of the word, but he said to be a doer. Of the, of, the, of the word. And then he talks about, oh Lord. He says, revive thy work. In other words, God, keep alive your purposes. God, keep alive your standards. God, keep alive what is right. He, he says, revive. We've said it before. Before you can be revived, you've got to be vived. You've got to be saved. But when you're saved, there, there's a coming back. There's a starting again. That's what Habakkuk is asking for. He says, revive thy work in the midst of the years. Make it known. In other words, God, do it now. God, I know about what you've done in the past, and I really believe you're going to do something great in the future, but, but God, I need you to do it now. I, I, I need a now word. And then he talked about this. In wrath, remember mercy. Oh, I want to tell you as a believer in Jesus Christ, you and I are not under the wrath of God. No, no, you and I are under the grace of God. There is a big difference between the, I don't want to be in the wrath of God. I, I don't want to live over there in my own. I don't want to do things my way. I want God's way. I want God to be true and every man a liar. And he said here, remember me. And remember me in mercy. You know what mercy is? Mercy is when we don't get what we do deserve. You see, revival is a work of God. You can't work it up. You can't stir it up. Revival is a work of God. And by the way, it's possible now. The Bible said in the last days he'd pour his spirit out upon all men. I want God to pour his spirit out upon us. I want God to pour his spirit out upon the Willow Park Baptist Church. I don't care what the church down the road's doing. I don't care what they're doing around the world. But I tell you, in this local church, I want God to be honored. I want revival in what we're doing. I want God to move. You see, revival is the work of God. You see, revival comes when God's people cry out. It comes the same way to every generation. It, it comes the same way to every church. And when we begin to seek God, we begin to confess our sins, we begin to cry out, what does the Bible say? If my people which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. You see, Habakkuk took personal responsibility. James chapter 4 and verse 8 says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. You're not waiting on God. God's waiting on you. There's a great quote. 
that says this about Charles Haddon Spurgeon. He said, if like Habakkuk, you ever become discouraged about the condition of the church, the state of the world, or your own spiritual life, he said, take time to pray and seek God's mercy. Spurgeon goes on to say, whether we like it or not, asking is the rule of the kingdom. The greatest need today is for intercessors. The Bible said in Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 16, and he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Praise God when Habakkuk saw this, he began to pray. Then you go to verses 3 through 15. And he went from prayer to where he goes to a vision. And the vision did this. The vision pondered the greatness of God. You see, in verses 3 through 5, God came in splendor. And here's how you know how great God is. It's, it's, it's revealed three ways, the greatness of God. Number one, the greatness of God is revealed in creation. All you have to do any day is look around. And Psalm 19 verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Praise God. If we get up every day, and we live in a world that God created. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Second thing is God reveals his greatness through the word of God. You want to know how great God is? You want to know what God will do for your life? You want to know how God can change circumstances? You go to the word of God. And can I tell you, praise God, we have the word of God. We have a sure word of testimony. We're not wondering if we got part of it, some of it. No, we got all of it, and it's in there. It's infallible, and praise God, it's inspired and preserved. Praise God. So we have the word of God, not only that, but you can look back at the, and see the greatness of God revealed in history. Oh, man, history. God worked in David's life, Jeremiah's life. God worked in Nehemiah's life. God, God worked in Mary's life. She was just a handmaiden of the Lord. God worked in Elijah's life and the widow woman's life. And over and over again, God's worked in our life. You see, you have a testimony today. You ought to be sharing that testimony with people, telling them of the greatness of God. Verses 3 through 5, God came unto Teman. And the Holy One from Paran and Selah, his glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise and his brightness was, of the, uh, was as the light. He had horns coming out of his hand and there was hiding of his power. For him went the pestilence and the burning coals went forth at his feet. You see, he's magnifying here the fact that God had moved in the land of Israel. He had moved in those Jewish people. When, when Pharaoh came against him, they said, wait a minute, God is greater than any Pharaoh in Egypt. You see, Pharaoh wouldn't acknowledge God's truth, and so he never experienced God's grace. You go to verses 6 through 7, and not only had God come in splendor, but God came in power. Because it talks about how he measured the earth. It talks about how he was the everlasting God. Oh, God can take the whole world in his own hands. God can move, and by a word, God can change every bit of the circumstances. And Habakkuk knew that. He talked about the everlasting God. You know what I think that phrase means? I think Habakkuk was saying, we may not be winning now. It may not look good now, but I tell you, we're going to win. Why? Because God is an everlasting God. God came in splendor. Uh, God came and stood in power. And then in verses 8 through 15, God marched in victory. Uh, look at verse 13. Verse, thir verse 13 said, Thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people, even for salvation with thine anointed, Thou wantest the head out of the house of the wicked by discovering the foundation unto the neck, Selah. You know what he's saying here? He's saying God moved. Hey, God gives victory. God gives salvation. Uh, verse 15, he starts talking about the Red Sea. You, you remember what happened? They were, they, were, uh, they were standing there at the Red Sea thinking, well, we're about to die. And, and the Bible said that, that the Red Sea opened, that the people of Israel, the, the Jewish people, they walked across. When they got to the other side, they were still being uh, pursued by Pharaoh and all of his armies. And then the waters began to close and they were all swept away. Jude 4 and 5 says this. It says, for there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of God unto lasciviousness and denying only the Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And then verse 5, listen to it. I will therefore put you in remembrance. Though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed them that believe not. You see, when you come back 
to this psalm, you're reminded that they're singing this song. They're reminding themselves through singing. And here's what I know about this song. It's not a shallow song. It's not just saying words over and over again because they rhyme. No, this has deep theology. And here's what it's doing. It's magnifying how great God is. So we had the prayer of Habakkuk. We had the vision of Habakkuk. And then you come to verses 16 through 19, and you have a faith that affirms the will of God. You see, he makes a confession. He starts saying with his mouth. We're going to talk next week about how when you know Jesus and you know his word and you know about the blood, you have to confess some things with your mouth. Out of the same mouth, the Bible says, proceedeth blessings and cursings. We're going to get into that next Sunday morning. But here, here's, what, here's what Habakkuk is doing. He's making a confession. He is speaking his faith. If you really believe something, you say it. Uh, you go back to 1 John. And this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears. And if we know he hears whatsoever we ask, we know. We know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. There is something about knowing this is God's will and I'm not afraid to say it. I have told you many times, I'm saying it again to the glory of God. That, that we're over there building. And by the way, you can drive down I-20, look north, and there's some walls up. Praise God. But I'm just telling you that the day, the day is going to come. And I think soon when we are celebrating the fact that not only are those buildings up, but they're paid for. Not only that, but we're going to take the money from this property, sell it, and give it to a world that needs Jesus. You say, why are you saying it? Because I believe it's going to happen. That's why. It's the confession in my mouth. I believe it. You say, Clark, how's that going to happen? Listen, I'm walking by faith, not by sight. Uh, my dependency is on God. And I want to tell you, there are no uh, resources that God doesn't have. You see, when you do the work of God and you do it God's way, you will never lack God's resources. And Habakkuk comes to a place where he makes a great confession of his faith. You see, the nation was invaded by the godless. Uh, people were hiding or they were dead. Uh, the land was ruined. Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed or they were in heaps. And yet, and yet, and yet in the midst of all these circumstances, Habakkuk said, I'll trust God no matter what. You know what I think God's looking for? I think God's looking for some no matter what Christians. I don't care what the world says. I don't care who's in office. I don't care what the price of oil is. I'm just, I'm just going to trust God. God's on the throne and God doesn't lack any resources. You, you look at verse 16. And verse 16 says this. When I heard, he said, my belly trembled. My lips quivered at thy voice. Rottenness entered into my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he cometh up unto the people, he will invade them with his troops. You know what he had? He had a feeling that, God, I'm just waiting on you. You see, he, he was not dependent upon his feelings because if you read verse 16, his feelings were shaky. He was quivering. He was trembling. He, he was scared to death. But here's what he was willing to do. He was willing to wait on God. Isn't it amazing how much of a mess we make when we get ahead of God? There's an Old Testament story about Abraham, and the Bible talks about the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but it talks about Abraham and his wife Sarah. They were given a promise, and that promise was they were going to have a child. And one day, they were going to number the stars in the sky and the sand by the seashore, and, and, and year after year went by, and no child came. And finally, Sarah said to Abraham, hey, hey, I, I, got, I got a handmaid. Her name is Hagar. Go, go into her. She'll have a son. And I love that son like he's my own. Well, it, well, she didn't. And Hagar had a son by the name of Ishmael. And the Bible said that Ishmael was a wild man to this day. And all, you, you, you look at all the misery. You look at all the pain for Hagar and for Ishmael, for, for, for Sarah and for Abraham. You, you look at how they got out ahead of God. Oh, don't, don't, don't get ahead of God. There's a story of where Moses, and we've been studying him on Wednesday nights. He knew he was a, a, to be a redeemer. He knew he was to lead the nation of Israel. But he got ahead of God, and he goes out and he kills a man, and he spends 40 years on the backside of the desert. When you look at this, no matter what was going on in Habakkuk's life, he said, God, I'm willing to wait on you. Psalm 46 and verse 10 says, be still. In other words, there are times, just, just stop. Just be still. Don't come up with some answers. Don't run to your buddies. Just, just be still. And here's what he says. And know that I am God. God's never going to leave us. 
God's never going to forsake us. And God is never going to let us down. And you say, but look at the world. Look at the circumstances. Look at my, I'm just telling you. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. That's what Habakkuk is doing. Then you come to verses 17 and 18. And it says, although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail, the field shall yield no meat, and the flock shall be off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. You see, the Babylonians had destroyed everything. But here's what Habakkuk knew. Even with everything gone, God lets us start again. I, I love those verses. I quote them to myself all the time. Romans chapter 8, verse 26, and likewise. The Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the heart knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Then you come to verse 28, and we know. Did you hear that? And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. You see, they were starting again. He was trembling and shaking. And as best we can tell, that he now breaks into worship. Did you catch the last part of that? He says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. He starts to sing. Paul and Silas sang when they were in the, in the jail and, and, and the walls begin to shake and, and the bars begin to open. Oh, friend, start praising. Start saying, God, I, I don't know how. I just know you and I know, God, you're good. You see, they went from waiting patiently to rejoicing in the Lord to their reliance upon God. Before I read this verse, let me ask you something. Who are you relying on? Is your reliance in a job? Is your reliance in, in, in uh, some other person? Because he says, I'm going to rely upon the Lord. And he says this. He said, the Lord is my strength. Can you say that? He said, he will make my feet like hinds feet. And he will make me to walk upon my high places to the chief singer on my stringed instrument. Did you get that? He said, the Lord is my strength. If God's your strength... You have no lack. You have no wants. He says, he will make my feet like hinds feet. You know what that means? That means the ability to climb higher. I mean, you, you say, look at my circumstance. I got, he'll make your feet like hinds feet. You'll climb to heights you've never climbed before when you make the Lord your strength. And then he says, he will make me to walk upon high places. In other words, to the chief, I love this, to the chief singer on my stringed instrument. He said, I'm going to sing. When it doesn't make sense, I am going to sing. You know what we find here? We find the prophet worshiping. You know what God's looking for today? Go back and read John 4, 24. We're done. John 4, 24. It says they that worship him. It says the Father seeketh such to worship him. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God's looking for worshipers today. You say, Clark, where does that start? You got to know you're a sinner. Hey, listen, nobody's going to heaven who thinks they're okay. You can't go to heaven if you're fine. You're not fine. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. You say, Clark, what do I do? Well, you can't save yourself. You can't earn your way there. The Bible said not by works of righteousness, which we have done. You're not going to get to heaven because you're good, because you've worked really hard. But you've got to know you're a sinner who can't save yourself. And you've got to look and say, God, you gave your son, Jesus, for me. I think I can prove to you from the word of God, had you been the only one who would have ever sinned, Jesus would have died for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus saves. And only Jesus saves. You're a sinner. You can't save yourself. Jesus died on a cross for you. So here's the question. Will today you make him the Lord and Savior of your life? Because the Bible said, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, it says they shall be saved. Would you like to go to heaven? Would you like to be forgiven? Would you like to know the Lord is your strength when it starts with salvation? You say, Clark, I'd like to know I'm going to heaven. I'd like to know that Jesus is my Savior. All right, right there where you're at. Bow your heads for just a moment. And just pray after me. Just say, dear God. Just pray this. Say, dear God, I know I'm a sinner. 
And I know I cannot save myself. I cannot earn salvation. I cannot deserve salvation. And I know it. So right now, I ask Jesus to come in my heart to forgive me of my sins and to give me eternal life. From this moment on, I put my faith and I put my trust in Jesus and in Jesus alone. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Thank you, Jesus, for coming in my heart. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving me of my sins and giving me eternal life. Thank you, Jesus, that because you're mine, one day heaven will be mine. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Now, listen, if you prayed that prayer, would you do me a favor? Would you call our church and let us know that? 817-441-1596 and just say, man, I got saved. But when Clark led us in that prayer, I prayed that prayer and I asked Jesus to be my Savior. I want to tell you, the Bible said there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. And I want to tell you, we want to rejoice with you. And hey, listen, let me just say this. If you're there and you have needs that no man can meet, let me just tell you, God's bigger than what's going on in your life. God's bigger than the circumstances. So back and prove that. And know this, that today we're praying for you and we love you. I hope you'll stay safe. I hope you'll stay warm. I remind you again, we'll have no services tonight. We'll let you know about what's going on the rest of the week. And uh, you can go to our website. You can go uh, by text app, uh, Facebook. You can go to anything on social media that can, has anything to do with Willow Park Baptist Church. And we're going to let you know. Uh, but we'll know about Wednesday night and some of the stuff that goes on through the week. And just know this. We want you to stay safe. And, hey, I'm blessed that you were here with us today. I love you. And I hope to see you soon. And by the way, we, uh, you can give on the giving kiosk, you can give online by church app, church text, automatic draw. But uh, if you've not given your tithes this week, you can go to our website and they'll help you do it. And if you have any trouble with that, you can call the church. Again, 817-441-1596 and somebody will help you. Okay, I love you. You guys be safe.